super excited for the discussion. I will maybe explain a little bit more on what this group is and so on after that. But for now, I don't want to take away of your precious speaking time. I'm excited to hear uh, what you have to share with us um, today. Thank you so much for taking time. I know it must be also quite late uh, on your end. And I am really excited for to hear about targeting DNA repair for aging interventions from you. And I will share uh, a lot more about your bio uh, and about the topic of your title. So the title of your topic and the, the, the description here in the chat. So with that being said, please take it away. After a 10 to 15 minute presentation, we're going to have a Q&A. If anyone has a question that is burning on the tip of their tongue, uh, then maybe you can raise your hand if it's regarding the slide and maybe Morton will take you on. Um, and otherwise, I will be collecting questions in the chat. All right, welcome uh, and it's nice to see you. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I can see that uh, Alex is also joining now. Um, I will uh, share my screen here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we're doing in the lab, which is called Targeted DNA Repair for Aging Interventions. So the lab is uh, interested in understanding uh, aging and trying to understand the uh, phenotypes that we see with age and um, how we can explain the molecular basis of these phenotypes and what we can do uh, to develop interventions for age-associated phenotypes. And so we all know that we develop grain of hair, facial wrinkles, we get redistribution of uh, fat and pigmentation changes, etc. cetera. Uh, and then it's done. Uh, so a bit depressing. So we sort of uh, scoured the literature that we downloaded PubMed to generate a, a, a better understanding of, of what uh, an aging population could look like. And so here we have the prevalence of features in, in an elderly population. Brain of hair is highly prevalent. It's about, sorry, I just gotta remove. Okay, so it's about, you know, everybody develops grain of hair. The 1% the that does not develop grain of hair are the ones that are completely bald. Um, and so um, many people develop muscle weakness. It's highly prevalent and so forth. About 40% will develop some type of cancer tr throughout their life uh, span, and between 10 and 20% will develop uh, some form of uh, dementia. And we don't really understand, I think, why some people develop some diseases and why some people develop other diseases. And so this is the uh, survival curve of the Danish population, basically. Um, and um, um, so this is data from about 5 million people. So this in itself is not particularly interesting, but if we look at um, sort of um, pharmacy data, so this is prescription data for, for the entire Danish population going back about 40 years. We can assign groups, uh, cohorts of individuals that have been giving or prescribed a certain drug throughout their lifespan. That means we get all kinds of different um, lifespan curves and some curves are above the um, mean lifespan of the population and some are below. So some drugs appear to be associated with a longer lifespan and some appear to be associated with a shorter lifespan. So this is work by a PhD student, uh, Michael Ben Esra from the group and he calls this the, uh, the Trump plot for obvious reasons, now we're in the uh, election season. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. So one of the first ones we looked at was, of course, uh, metformin. And, and uh, this is looking at metformin um, across the entire population. Um, and here it's associated with actually lifespan shortening. But if you look at giving metformin at the year 70, uh, we do see, and I unfortunately don't have that data here, but we do see that here metformin is associated with a lifespan extension, but it, the survival curves cross over at some point after three or five years. And this may be due to the underlying diabetic um, um, condition. And so I think this is, metformin is obviously an interesting drug, and I'm glad that neobastla is also uh, on this call. Uh, so, um, so this is something we are, of course, looking into which drugs we could um, 
that could influence aging. And so aging is not magic. Aging can be influenced by drugs, uh, but aging can also be influenced by genes. And so there's a number of premature aging diseases. There's a large list of them that where patients have inherited a single gene mutation from their parents, and then they grow old more rapidly than they should. Uh, most of these diseases are associated with uh, defects in DNA repair. And so if you are unable to repair DNA, you age faster. So DNA repair is likely important in aging. So what if we could somehow stimulate DNA repair? This could potentially um, be a way to um, increase longevity, increase healthy aging. So how we did this was by looking back at uh, Nietzsche, uh, who uh, taught us that what does not uh, kill us makes us stronger. And so this is actually a sentence that, that uh, is true also for cells. So if you treat cells with a certain stress and that cell survives, then it becomes more resistant to subsequent stresses. This is an effect called the hormetic response. And so if you, for example, irradiate cells with low dose gamma irradiation, then the cells will become more resistant to this uh, irradiation in, future, uh, in, in, in the future. And so we um, explored this by looking at drugs that would mimic uh, radiation induced damage to see if we could elicit this response sort of in an artificial manner, but without itself inducing DNA damage. And this is done in collaboration with Intelical med Medicine. Uh, and I saw that Alex Sharonko just locked uh, on. I'm very happy for this collaboration. So we uh, trained a, a deep neural network to be able to recognize these hormetic signals signatures and then we screened a large number of compounds and then we're testing them in animal models so this is spearheaded by a very uh, talented postdoc Garrick Makarajichan from the lab and so we screened uh, up actually more than 15,000 compounds in silico and uh, we can see some of them appear to have uh, uh, could elicit this type of response but of course, we wanted drugs that elicit the response, but did not induce DNA damage by itself. And so to uh, investigate this, we uh, worked with a company called Amelia uh, Technologies, where we are using an assay that have, they uh, have contributed with developing, which is uh, a high content comet chip assay. So you're looking at these micro wells that contain single nuclei, and then you can look at if there's damage in these nuclei. And so it's called a comet assay because you put the nuclei in, uh, embed them in agar, and then you run them through an electrophoretic field and stain them with uh, some DNA dye. And you can see the more breaks you have, the more of the DNA will be able to um, migrate out of the nucleus. And then you get these sort of comet-like structures. The more you have the more damage. And so certain drugs in our screen did appear to induce DNA damage, but many of them actually did not induce DNA damage. And so a second way to look for DNA damage is to look for markers of DNA damage. There are two that are sort of the most popular, which is gamma H2AX and 53 BB1. And so you can see here, this is just an example. If you uh, treat cells with ionizing radiation, you get more uh, of these DNA damage foci. And so doing this, we can see that, again, there are certain compounds that induce DNA damage with gamma H2X and 53 b one but there's a lot that don't. Uh, there's actually some that are quite interesting. So th this drug C appears to um, induce gamma H2X, but inhibit 53 bb one so you get this sort of biased DNA damage activation. And we're also looking into this drug. One of the readouts was, of course, to see if the drugs would protect against ionizing radiation. And indeed, a number of compounds actually protected uh, the cells from a really massive dose of ionizing radiation, so 16 gray, which normally kills 80% of the cells. If you treat cells with these compounds here, they become completely immune to this uh, 16 gray ionizing radiation in salt. 
one of them um, one of the lead compounds we found was uh, we tested several uh, in uh, in primary fibroblasts looking at the replicative senescence and we saw that uh, drug F here appeared to increase replicative lifespan uh, of cells and culture. And so we, of course, wanted to understand if it also affects senescence. And here, a PhD student, Indra Hagenbach, he has developed in um, deep neural network-based way to identify cells and identify beta-gal positive cells. This can be quite challenging, actually, because beta-gal is sort of uh, can be a little bit gray in gray. Uh, so it can be challenging to see which cell actually con contains beta gal and so on. So we developed uh, an assay that's actually able to um, determine that, but it's also able to actually determine if a, if a cell is senescent or not. So this is a work that we are uh, currently finishing. I hope it will be submitted very soon. And this will be a tool for the field to use where you can upload simple DAPI images, and then you get a very high probability of whether or not the, the, the images you uploaded come from senescent cells. So using this approach, we can see that there is uh, fewer senescent cells. If, um, when, you, when you treat uh, these IR-induced senescent fibroblasts with drug F. And in fact, uh, not only are there fewer senescent cells, but the cells that are there uh, start uh, growing again. They start expressing PCNA and they start actually uh, um, growing, um, which is, I think, quite remarkable. So they go into cell cycle again. And um, one aspect of senescence is this accumulation of persistent DNA damaged foci with the three BB1. These are foci that are thought of to be not repairable by the cell, but when you treat with drug F, we can actually just see that you also reduce the amount of these persistent foci. Um, and this was done in uh, replicative senescent cells, but this is also true in IR-induced senescent cells. So you have fewer of these persistent IR-induced foci. So we also want to test it in, in, uh, in animal models, and we're starting with uh, Drosophila, where we have... Um, developed an AI, actually spinning out a company called Track Bio, where we can track animal models, for example, uh, fruit flies. And we can then do in a high throughput way, look at motor function because we can see the movements and we can also measure lifespan uh, in a very detailed resolution, time-wise resolution. And so this is how you, you, you can see the output uh, of of this assay is you get, um, um, this is the, the tracks from each of the fruit flies. And this is when you're young, the fruit flies sort of walk around a lot. If you're on drug F, maybe you walk uh, a little bit more, or maybe there's not that much of a difference. When you're an old fruit fly, you walk less, unless if you're on drug F, you walk, you still walk a lot. And walking uh, distance and speed are actually quite good parameters to measure mortality across species. It's very strongly, a decrease in gait speed is very strongly associated with an increased uh, mortality risk in, in humans. And we see also in fruit flies with age, you tend, they tend to walk less unless they are on drug F. So drug F also extends uh, lifespan. So we're looking into also uh, analogs of drug F, and we have found a number of these analogs to um, potentially, for example, we can see this uh, drug F.6 uh, seems to be potentially a little bit more potent than the original drug F compound. So this is quite exciting. This is where we are. And um, hopefully we can um, soon go into animal models and we will particularly target neurodegenerative diseases because we know drug F actually goes to the brain. Um, and with this, I will just, I think, stop here and take any questions. This is uh, the lab. 
uh, and uh, some of our funding sources here and some of our collaborators. And I'd be happy to take any questions um, if there are any. Thank you so much. Ravi, you go first. Yeah, just a question. Do you have um, interesting, do you have ideas about what the mechanism of action is of this drug and how it actually operates on the DNA damage repair pathway? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question and, and something we're looking into. We really don't have any idea about this. I think in general, these types of DNA damage foci are, are thought to be irreparable. So it's quite interesting that we're able to actually reduce the amount of these foci, but we don't know the mechanism right now. So we're doing various um, approaches to to investigate this, uh, but, but I can't uh, reveal anything more right now. I think Nia has a, has a has a question. Yeah, go for it. That, that's terrific. I, I actually, I think I saw, you know, it looked, uh, f I had deja vu, right? I saw it not long ago. <laughs> uh, I understand it better. So look, look, I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the frustration with DNA repair is all evolution depends on that, that will have mutations, right? Yeah. <laughs> and now we want to stop them, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really, it's really a challenge, although it's clearly accelerated with aging. So, but my my question about the screening, you you take a cell replication as a phenotype, right? That you start with, and and uh, you, you know, basically in nature there is exchange between reproduction and longevity. Now you showed one um, one therapy that you got through lifespan, but did you find some others that you saw they are uh, really replicating better, but actually longevity is shorter? You, hmm. you showed just okay. one, but you had yeah. screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the replicative lifespan experiments were not done in, in that, that were only done in, I think, three or four compounds because this is an experiment that takes six months and the postdoc has to take care of the cells for all these. So it's a huge amount of work. Um, but it's an actually an interesting question because also because we know that slowing down replication is probably good for cells because it gives them a little bit more time to sort of repair damage before the cells progress. We know that from the pop R1 um, mice, for example. So this is an interesting um, question. We, we have not looked into that, but that's a very uh, interesting point. Terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, Alex, you had a question too? I guess uh, he's asking, I can see Alex is asking on, on the chat if there's a difference in markers of senescence in the different cell types. He may be speaking Chinese because he's in <laughs> Shanghai, I guess. So this is why we're not there. <laughs> anyway, um, we have, uh, we have, primarily looked into fibroblasts. We have also looked into, with, in terms of senescence markers, we've looked into fibroblasts and we have looked in, uh, we looked at lamin B1, which reduces uh, when cells replicate. And with drug F, you increase lamin B1 levels to a sort of younger uh, level. Looking, using our senescence predictor, we see that we are reducing the amount of senescence using the predictor. In fibroblast, in if we look at other cell types, and so this is in, in actually several different types of fibroblasts. We also looked into patient fibroblasts and seen a reduction in DNA damage in some of these premature aging fibroblasts, ataxia telangiectasia, cocaine syndrome, and hodgkin uh, gilfos progeria. All of them, there's a slight, there's an elevation in DNA damage, and this drug does reduce it in. In, uh, in other cell types, we looked into primary neurons from mice that we have irradiated with gamma radiation and where this also reduces the amount of damage in, in the neurons, primary neurons. But we have not looked in senescence in other cell types than, uh, than fibroblasts. 
Thank you. Um, anyone else question, comment? I have an unrelated uh, question to uh, to the. I remember when I saw your presentation, um, you were just mentioning that you were launching a new, uh, well, a new journal, really like the Frontiers in Aging one. And um, I think at yeah. that particular point, uh, you were like, calling for papers or at least like for collaborators in that. And I'm curious what yeah. made, got you started on that journal and uh, and where, where that's standing right now. You know, what's kind of like the the, the specific yeah. function I mean, of that journal? So. Yeah, I mean, I was contacted. So Frontiers in Aging is starting out now as, as another Frontiers um, branch. I like the Frontiers uh, approach because it's sort of open source and you can see who's editing the papers. So it's less potentially biased. And so I was approached uh, by the Frontiers organization at some point. I'm not sure if someone recommended me or how they found me but they approached me and asked if i wanted to do uh, something like this i think um maybe it was in connection with the the um, aging meeting that we organized me and alex and daniela bakula so but but the the journal is open now and we are starting with some research topics uh, this is still under development we are slowly getting papers in um, but hopefully we'll get more soon okay well let us know when there's you know if there's kind of like a call for paper or something i'm happy to share it and yeah. before i ask more with boring ecosystem sure. questions that are terribly interesting to me i think liz Parrish and then martin edelstein still have someone that are specifically focused on the yeah. topic liz do you want to go for it yeah. and then martin you go and then i'll yeah. jump in with my more admin related questions sure i was yeah. a to the conversation, I was wondering what sort of inflammation changes that you saw in your model organism. Did you see um, less inflammation? Uh, you know, what sort of things uh, tracked you back to the fact that you were removing senescent cells? Yeah, so this is a great question. We actually have not looked into that, but this is something that we definitely should look into. Um, obviously, we expect that inflammation markers should be increased. Uh, and that the drugs will reduce that. Um, we have not looked into it, but it's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Martin, do you want to go for it? Yeah, I was just wondering if you've looked into using uh, nucleosides and various nucleosides analogs that are currently being used uh, as drugs against cancer in your work. Yeah. Um, we have, um, we have not, they're not part of the list of the top drugs that we found in the screen. There are some uh, cancer drugs in that screen. I believe there's a tobisomerase inhibitor in uh, the top screen, which is expected. We would expect that some of these um because we're screening for compounds that induce a DNA damage response, essentially, right? So this is what we want to find, but without inducing DNA damage. Um, we didn't, I don't think we saw any nucleoside analogs in that list. Um, but we, so I, I can, maybe I can sort of just elaborate a little bit on, on I mentioned this sort of bias activator where we saw more gamma to x and less 53 pp one so this suggests that we are inhibiting specific repair pathway not homologous and joining. And we are finding that this is potentially quite potent in, in certain types of cancers that are, that are deficient in other repair pathways. So we looked into um, a couple of, we compared it with the, um, of course, the PARP inhibitor work. Uh, and it, it appears to be reasonably potent in this context but uh but we have not tested nucleoside analogs so I'm, I'm weaving around your question a little bit yeah they were looked at in the i don't know 1950s or 60s uh to protect against radiation damage right this is very um, and i was just sort of this is old stuff from leo salad's time yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and i was just sort of just an interesting yeah, this is thought because they were thought of to affect uh, repair. 
Yeah. But this is, we have not done that. And it's simply yeah. because they were not in the list, but this is actually very interesting. Yeah. Well, you got a few research suggestions coming up here from, sure. <laughs> from, yeah, from, from the audience. Um, awesome. Lynn, you have two questions if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, um, thanks. That was really exciting. Um, two things. Uh, Drosophila is actually a really cool model for looking uh, to moving from cell culture to organisms. Uh, we're trying to do it as well. And simply we have grad students who measure how far up a tube the flies can climb. So I'm very intrigued by your automated um, yeah. fly monitoring system. Is yeah. it something that you are envisaging rolling out to the academic community? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we are collaborating with actually multiple groups uh, around the world using this system. So if, if you're interested in, in testing something in the system, we're definitely happy to do that. Okay, that's that really cool. Hmm? Yeah. And the other question was actually a bit more specific about the DNA damage response. We've yeah. um, been looking at whether if a cell doesn't know it's damaged, it doesn't respond badly so it, it's not having damage that's bad for you it's knowing that you've got the damage yes um do you know if any of your drugs actually inhibit part way down in that pathway and it would that would be suggested by the differential effect on 53 bp1 and gamma h2ax yeah i think maybe i skipped over that a little bit uh or maybe i didn't show that so one of the this is exactly what we were what i'm thinking about also that it's really the damage signaling that's the issue and so we, we looked at it in the way where we uh, treated with the um, compound for two days as we do. So this is after ionizing radiation, we treat for two days. And then we actually withdrew the compound and then looked two days further down to see if the DNA damage markers would reappear. Okay. Uh, if it was, if maybe we were just inhibiting ATM or some other typical DNA damage uh, responsive enzyme and that did not seem to be the case actually the damage appeared to still be down after these couple of days later so we don't think that is sort of just targeting one of the okay because um historically um in ionizing radiation in mice you can protect them um, from cancer, but also from massive apoptosis by giving them pifithrin, which is a P53 inhibitor. So they get the P16 response, so they get the tumor suppressive response, but they don't get the massive apoptotic response. And I'm wondering if some of the stuff you're looking at might be similar to that mechanism. Yeah, this is a great uh, possibility. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to find out what your drugs are. No, <laughs> That's no, 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 no. I mean, one, one thing that we would we would not expect then to affect the foci, right? It would rather be a downstream uh, effect. I mean, but yeah. <clears throat> but um, we we ha we really have no idea of the mechanism. Uh, but we are working very hard on it. We're doing various types of mass spec approaches where we try to identify possible targets, um, and we're using both our. Um, analogs, so multiple analogs, and then our uh, analogs that have no function. So we have sort of a quite large <laughs> amount of control. So I think this should hopefully give us something. Okay. Uh, okay. We actually know the target of drug F. It is a published uh, compound, but the effect that we see is like an off-target effect. Okay. Or rather, it is an off-target effect um, really because we cool. have to use much higher concentrations. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions uh, to the specific talk? Otherwise, I'll come again with my eco question, ecosystem questions. All right. You have the uh, the chance to still be collecting in the chat. Great. Thank you. It was initiated by kind of like the observation. Hey, you know, uh, it seems like with COVID. Um, Folks are waking up a little bit to something that you know is, uh, is kind of like on the forefront of, of this community or, and has been for a while, right? Um, and you know that is kind of aging as a, as a major risk, risk factor for most of the diseases that uh, that we care about. So I'm wondering how that kind of like whether or not that perception has arrived in Denmark. Like, how have you seen kind of like the uh, with your work change? Has it gotten? more attraction, like how is the general perception uh, in your area and toward, and toward aging and longevity as a field? 
and how has it shifted since COVID? Do you think there's specific opportunities that you know one could be taking that um, we in the US or at least a few of us in the US may not be aware of that you know we could perhaps copy? Like what's what's been kind of like happening since COVID there in Denmark. Well, not necessarily in Denmark, but like yeah. I think the general, I guess, like European sector, like we, I yeah. know that a few yeah. folks, so we had, uh, you know, I guess like Ola and Niels from Apollo on a few times. And, you know, they've yeah. basically said that uh, actually, you know, the German government is quite uh, excited and interested and, and they, they seem to be behaving quite rationally. And they have a, a few, I guess, like papers in the making yeah. um, that, that, that at least, um, I guess, signal that there is some, some kind of like, well-reasoned attention to the field uh, and uh, that hasn't really happened in the US. So I'm just wondering whether there is, whether you see opportunities arising for, you know, our community. I, mean, that I think that in general, the, 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 um, if we're thinking about pharma, I think there is a, an increasing interest from pharma to, to go into the aging space. And this is, I mean, there are many big pharma companies in Europe, and I think there's actually quite a lot of interest from these pharma companies. I think one of the, uh, I mean, I, I used to live in the States for a, quite a while, and I think one of the differences between the States and Europe in terms of, um, in terms of academic funding is that the States have had the National Institute on Aging and uh, sort of study sections on aging for a very, very long time. And in, in Europe, that's still not there. So if you go for ERC funding, you you cannot apply for an aging section. You have to apply for a new neuroscience section or something that's a little bit more um, peripherally to the aging space. So this is, I think, is in my opinion, one of the potential reasons why I think the field is better developed in the States. Uh, in terms of uh, investments, there is a huge amount of companies that are popping up and um, this I think occurs in Europe and as well as in the States. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure if there's a, a large difference there. Um, I may not be the perfect person to ask about this. Uh, in terms of Corona, um, obviously, this is, uh, has, I think, hugely impacted everybody, um, including scientists. I don't know in Denmark if, if this has uh, put more focus on the aging um, field. We know, of course, that corona is much more lethal in old individuals. So in that sense, it's it should... Uh, facilitate more thought about aging. We have, my lab has received some of this Corona funding to, to, to try to answer some of these specific Corona related questions and potential development interventions. But um, I don't know, I think there's a general, I think the, for me, the most exciting part is that, that sort of big pharma companies are really getting into this uh, space, which I think is it's very exciting. Uh, and anything that this group could, you know, help accelerate, or what do you think, you know, are current bottlenecks that to, you know, to make progress happen faster? I mean, I, I do a lot of basic science, uh, of course, but I really think that we need to start testing uh, interventions in humans. Um, and I think we need to do this in maybe some some way or a similar way that was done with the aging interventions testing program in at the NIA in in mice. Um, and I think we can do the same for humans. So, and we have so many great biomarkers. I mean, Alex, uh, of course, Alex Avronko is of course an expert in in this topic here and we are already able to measure aging in many ways and so i think we have the tools necessary to at least begin to see if we can affect the aging pace in humans i think this is what we really need to do yeah yeah um, that, i think that's right i think you know i think maybe even also to lynn's question 
um, you shared, I think, on Twitter the um, the tracked uh, bio, um, mm -hmm. the tra track bio like uh, AI based phenotyping of animal models, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, I think you know at least would you would you care to say a few words about that big brother style approach and and how that's yeah. accessible now sure i mean so this is uh really in a way that's a somewhat simple idea it's basically to be able to just follow animal models over time and if you do that with a large enough amount of animal models then you can begin to develop algorithms that can predict the health uh, behavior of, of animal models. Um, and so we've done that for quite a long time with, with Drosophila. And we have, uh, I think, quite good tools to be able to measure and, and monitor um, lifespan, health span in Drosophila. And we do it in their own sort of their um, uh, natural habitat as a lab drosophila you know in the tubes so you don't have to have specialized equipment but we have um we have developed our own equipment that that we use and uh it's relatively affordable and it just takes it's it takes uh you know a lot of hard drives uh and then a strong computer and then you can i think get some great results out and um, I think this is very useful for testing large amount of compounds. <clears throat> Lovely, thank you. Yeah, I just shared the uh, the link in the chat. Uh, I think you know, harking back on the um, kind of point on on COVID from just now, uh, Lynn, you you made a comment in the chat, and I know that you know I'm usually whenever I get folks who are not from the US, right? Uh, I, I usually try to que query them about you know how the governmental response has been to to COVID specifically, and like whether or not it has increased uh, a focus on, on aging in, uh, in beneficial ways. So Lynn, if you want to say a few words and specifically about the, um, I think the Lancet Healthy Longevity um, post, then it would be awesome. Okay, yeah. Um, apologies that my voice is gone. I've got a very sore throat. Um, so uh, from last March, we tried to get the UK government to get interested in a trial using RTB101, which is an mTOR inhibitor that Joan Manick has shown supports the elderly immune system. And after going through many, many hurdles with all sorts of different aspects of UK government, so Public Health England, um, National Institute of Medical Research, the office of the um, chief medical officer, in the end, we were rejected on the basis that um, protecting older people from COVID was not a priority, which struck us as a somewhat interesting political point. We are still pushing for it, but we thought one way of getting, um, of, of motivating um, the field was to get uh, active clinicians and geriatricians on board. So we decided to write for The Lancet um, so that we could target clinicians specifically. And we have written about metformin near, so <laughs> you're in there. Um, so mTOR inhibitors, metformin, statins, and, and just trying to raise the profile of geroprotectors in terms of improving outcomes, but particularly in dealing with immunosenescence, so supporting the elderly immune system. And I'm sure you've all seen the um, nature um, excuse me, Nature Aging Review on drugs in aging as well that came out um, not long ago, suggesting that those things are also um, beneficial in COVID. I've just seen the thing. Yes, um, we were a little bit shocked by the comment from NIHR. Um, I think what they were saying was we were fast uh, past the first wave. I'm that was our interpretation, our generous interpretation, rather than older people are not a priority. Um, but it's very, very short sighted, given that we're now coming through the uh, the second wave. So, Nia, you've got a point there, haven't you? Yeah. I, I first of all, first of all, feel better, Lean. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not COVID. Um, no, I've been tested. <laughs> okay, and uh, and this is what we're doing now. We we kind of change the focus to immunization, which is really what uh, John has shown. And we can argue that most of the immunizations that are planned are not going to be so effective at the elderly. They're even not going to work. They're even not going to show it in the elderly because. 
the fact that you take somebody who's 60 years old that doesn't have disease is biologically not old. So I, I think the focus now has actually to use the immunization and say, look, if the elderly are not going to immunize well, you're not going to change mortality by a lot. You're not going to uh, open the economy. I think this is the next stage for us. So think, think of this approach. Well, we have been trying with that. So Janet Lord, who's the co-signatory on the um, the commentary, um, was on SAGE, which advises the UK government. And she was the only immunologist in the room who had any experience of aging. And nobody else was taking any notice of the impact of immunosenescence. So she was discussing adjuvants, dosing, all sorts of things that are very important in getting a, a good, robust elderly immune response. And no one seemed bothered by it. I mean, one positive thing is that the Oxford vaccine appears to be beneficial in over 65s. So hopefully the, the there is some light at the end of the tunnel. But Alex's question about RTB101, it didn't even get to mechanisms of action. Um, it, it was simply that we were trying to do trials in older people. <laughs> yeah, but Lynn, actually, sorry for making this comment. Uh, but no, it's a fair uh, comment. Uh, I, 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 I know the, the molecule now quite well, right? And I think that uh, if you are going with something that is uh, very commercial, of course, right? But at the same time, uh, I haven't seen any data uh, showing that it's in any way better than rapamycin or Averilimus, or specifically Averilimus, where the phase two um, A clinical studies were conducted. Um, I mean, I, I would re have rejected it myself as well. Yeah, uh, well, I so have seen the phase three data. I've seen a lot of the confidential unpublished phase three, which made us go for it. But that, that that's a rather different point about the MOA of the drug. It was simply that um, putting older people into clinical trials is something that isn't normally done. Well, yes, but the UK is also at the forefront uh, of, uh, I would say, again, longevity policy. And uh, there is a PPG for longevity that you are part of. And uh, you are, of course, doing a great job there. But I think that the yeah, UK is probably one of the most uh, uh, advanced co countries in, in that area. But yeah, sorry for making this comment. I just uh, nice. don't, I, I think can that I just, before we, yeah. Can I just, uh, um, like for both of you, first of all, Alex, you're right um, that uh, not only it's not different than rapamycin, this drug has never been shown to actually extend longevity in animals, okay? Exactly, okay. But, bingo, yeah. But on the other hand, John Manick yesterday actually revealed in a pre-symposium in the GSA, um, she revealed the data from her study. And it's, it's really sorrowful because the, the primary aim was to ask people if they're feeling better. And, you know, my comment is the elderly always complain, you know, uh, you, have to, you have to actually develop instruments. It's not like young people who you ask, you have pain or you don't have pain and they'll answer you here. No, I'm tired. I'm that I'm sleeping. I'm not sleeping to, to develop, to develop such a, um, such an aim, you have to do it in the elderly and they really fucked her up for that, okay? But the secondary endpoint of immunization and, and you know, response to therapy, they're all actually pretty good, okay? So uh, it, it's, you know, she showed, she, she repeated almost the same thing as 2B for what was her aims in 2B. <laughs> but she didn't reach a, pr pr a primary aim in thing. So we all have to learn from that and educate the FDA because they really screwed it for all of us. I agree uh, with you 100%, especially screwed up, screwed it up for everybody doing repologs, right? You can talk to Brian Kennedy, he'll have his own opinion. Uh, but yeah, so thank you. And uh, I think that your trial theme will be kind of the first highlight of uh, what needs to be done, right? And uh, uh, it needs to be repeated for uh, uh, rapamycin, just because the side effect uh, uh, profile is very well known, very well tolerated drug. I would say probably just like metformin, depending on how you take it. Um, I know, of course, there are side effects. Uh, I tested it myself and myself, <laughs> uh, saw side effects. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, yeah, so we should probably take a drug that has been used by millions to, to, to try it first. Uh, but 
I, of course, uh, admire uh, uh, John Manik for what she, she she has done, but I think the big pharma attitude uh, uh, played a big role in uh, you know why it failed as well. Also, they didn't use a clock, uh, any clock, uh, in the trial, and uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be addressed, right? At least you can use uh, blood tests and uh, re uh, release the blood tests from the patients. Uh, that have been uh, uh, before uh, that, that 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 was were collected before the the drug and after the drug, so it's really amazing um, data data sets that, that could have been uh, tested by us, for example, uh, and yeah, but you know for for us we of course are all frustrated and angry and you know I'm right now in quarantine in China for the second week and. Uh, uh, here it's a lar largest human vivarium actually, so you are you're getting food in regular intervals, and it's very specific food every day. So I'm also quite frustrated that they're not using you know your blood tests before and after just to see the interventions. Uh, I mean the effects of this diet and uh, lifestyle on on your quarantine um, and you, on your body. Uh, but sorry for this comment. I wanted to uh, actually ask a question to uh, to Morton, if possible, because uh, uh, again, I deeply admire Morton, admire his work, admire uh, his group. Uh, really amazing. Um, uh, really, the highlight of uh, of uh, uh, you know every collaborations that we have. Uh, and uh, Morton is also a physician, so there are very few physician scientists uh, out there. Uh, and uh, I deeply admire them. So from the physician's perspective, Martin, um, how do we engage more physicians to get more interested in you know, longevity and specifically clinical trials? Uh, and what kind of pivotal experiments need to be done? Uh, and to me, it looks like a chicken and egg problem, right? So you need to, to, to do the clinical studies and actually metaclinical studies as well, um, because you cannot just put people in cages like I am right now. <laughs> I, uh, and uh, I, you, uh, you will need to do a metaclinical study, but at the same time, the physicians would not want to have metaclinical studies at the same time. So can you tell me this, uh, uh, your, your perspective from the physician's perspective? So how do you see um, medical doctors being involved in this more? Sure. So I think the... I guess the main issue is that you don't, when you're a physician, you don't really think of aging as a something that you can do anything about. And I think this is simply because we probably don't have any tools that can actually do that right now. Maybe we do, but we just haven't shown it really in humans. So I think once we show some, um, if we have a trial now near, He's also an MD, of course, he just left. Near's trial, for example, if we show that metformin reduces mortality in elderly individuals, then that will be taken up by physicians for sure. Um, we're treating people with um, statins, with, um, with uh, antihypertensives, which uh, you have to treat a significant amount of people to be able to save just one person. So if, if we can show with other interventions a similar efficacy in terms of mortality rate, then for sure this will be picked up by physicians. But right now we just don't have any solid evidence of that. Um, we need to get that in a larger scale study. And for that, I think we eventually will need big pharma somehow involved in this because they will be the only ones that are able to afford to actually drive these types of trials. Um, but I, I, I don't think the physicians or the, the clinical community as such are, I think they're just agnostic against this. We have to show that it actually works. If we can show it works, then I think they're very happy to get on board. What, what do you think was the main driver to Big Pharma becoming interested in, you know, how could one accelerate that process? Um, it's... This is a good question. I, I mean, I know they are interested and obviously it, it makes financial sense. If you can find a uh, drug that does something to aging, you have a pretty big market there, you know? So uh, I think, um, I think there's quite a lot of interest. Um, 
but maybe we don't know enough. Uh, maybe we still need some basic science and maybe smaller scale uh, investigations that can show changes. And I think in terms of the US, of course, we need some, some way to, to have aging as, a, as something you can, can, uh, can, can get your health insurance to cover or something like that, you know? So this is a, this is a, this is a challenge from, from getting, getting money out of the system in, in the US, but maybe not as much in, in Europe. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that that has been like a con continuous point of discussion here and specifically there. I think the biomarker uh, aspect was one part of pot potentially getting folks interested in uh, in measuring the actual age and, and then getting that reflected more in the more consumer choices that they make uh, to then incentivize companies to uh, to focus a little bit more on that uh, that particular way of measuring uh, of measuring your age. Um, all right. So uh, one and last question that I uh, usually always ask is, uh, what can people here on this call do to help your work? Uh, what's kind of uh, going on? What's what's new for you? Uh, I, I mean, you mentioned uh, the uh, the journal, but if there's anything else that you know people here can do to to make progress, then let us know, please. I mean, I'm, we're always interested in collaborators, and I think the journal is is uh, would be great so if you want to submit papers but it's not the main uh, thing you know the main thing is to drive science forward uh, so if people want to use our systems and test drugs in our drosophila lifespan machine then definitely we should do that definitely and if there are people that have want to collaborate on other aspects i think we should do that also we're in this to drive science forward for the betterment of humankind. And um, this is what I'm interested in. I, I don't care much about a journal unless we can drive science forward. All right, lovely. Thank you so, so much for joining. Please share any relevant links uh, for this group afterwards. Um, that would be fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Um, I know that, uh, okay, Anastasia just popped off, but there's an update from of her in the chat and uh, we'll have a little bit of a community round, but I think, you know, Alex said it uh, correctly. Bravo, uh, Morten. Thank you so, so much. I think I'm also going to share your longer talk uh, in the uh, in the follow-up that I'll send uh, out to people because I think uh, that's probably quite useful for people to get uh, bits. Um, thank you very thank much. Thank you so, so much for joining. It was really lovely. And Ravi, you had uh, a final community announcement. Uh, I know that you've been kind of like corralling people uh, to... Uh, get on a project and uh, there's a doodle out for that. So Ravi, if you want to say a few words uh, on that project and Martin, thank you so, so, so much from all of us. It was really, really a pleasure uh, to have you on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. So just there was a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago about biomarkers. And so I started a thread on the mailing uh, list about looking at what sort of biomarker data we might collect and if that was a project uh, that people were interested in. Um, so I just wanted to send out a doodle poll, which I'll do now on trying to have a breakout discussion of people who are interested, um, just to talk about what sort of biomarker data we might collect, um, whether that would be something we could fund if there are areas we were interested in targeting and what would be most valuable to do. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up on the doodle poll and then I'll send out a, an invitation today or tomorrow and we can continue that discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. And we have uh, Morgan Levine coming up on, I think, November 11. All right, everyone. It was lovely to see you all. And I uh, hope to see you all on next Friday. Bye-bye.